Thank you. Um, I'm so pleased that these bills are being moved forward, and thank you for letting me have the opportunity to speak on behalf of them tonight. Um, the current process of establishing parentage for LGBT couples in Rhode Island is unwieldy, expensive, drawn out, and invasive. Family law exists to protect children, and the current system for establishing parentage violates that principle and leaves Rhode Island children vulnerable. My daughter, June, who's over there, I told her I'd take her to build a bear if she came tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, is a much wished for, planned for, and loved child. Her other mom, Hillary, and I traveled to Washington, D.C. to marry as soon as same-sex marriage was legalized there, in part to strengthen our joint parentage claim on the child we hope to conceive. Together, we chose an anonymous sperm donor. We planned, attended, and paid for reproductive treatments that resulted in June's conception. We attended prenatal appointments, decorated a nursery, told our friends and family that we were planning to have a child. We both applied for maternity leave so we'd be able to care for June when she was born. We compared our insurance plans to see who should cover the new baby and found that Hillary's insurer wouldn't cover June because we wouldn't have enough proof of Hillary's parentage immediately after birth. After two uneventful trimesters, I became very sick with preeclampsia and was admitted to the hospital at 27 weeks pregnancy. While I was on hospital bed rest for two weeks, Hillary and I scrambled to start preparing our second parent adoption paperwork. And attached to this letter, you'll see all the questionnaires, questions that Julie referred to um, in her testimony, 18 pages of them. Um, We wrote answers to the questions the court requested. Um, I wrote mine from my hospital bed. Hillary wrote hers while managing the household and a full-time job and coming to the hospital every day. When I became too sick to continue the preg pregnancy, I gave birth to June at 29 weeks gestation. Hillary was in the delivery room with me. After June was taken to the NICU, Hillary was the first person to hold her at the discretion of the hospital staff. Hillary had no right to be there. I spent an additional five hours in surgery and recovery, and during which Hillary was June's only conscious and functional parent. Despite the fact that Hillary acted like a parent, that we both believed that she was June's parent, legally she was a stranger to June at that time. She could not make any medical decisions for our two pound, three ounce baby who required intubation and other medical procedures during her first 12 hours of life. These were all chosen and done at the discretion of the hospital staff. June's birth left us with a lot of what ifs. What if we had disagreed with the doctor's choice of treatment? What if there had been medical decisions that required our input or decision? In those cases, June would have been without a parent to advocate for her because her one parent capable of making those decisions wasn't acknowledged as her parent. You know, our story is a lot more dramatic than most, but it shows the real gaps in current parentage laws and the real need for HB 5707. June spent 77 days in the NICU, and our second parent adoption journey encompassed 87 days. During that time, we balanced days and nights in the NICU, work, adoption paperwork. I remember our lawyer coming to labor and delivery where I signed paperwork related to June's adoption and Hillary's right during the time before the adoption was finalized. Um, one of the effects of the medications I was on was a weakening of all the muscles in my body. So I wasn't actually able to focus my eyes during the time. So the lawyer gave me the paperwork and I just had to like scribble something on there because I couldn't actually see. We answered extensive survey questions. 
We asked friends and family to write letters on our behalf, attesting to our good character. We paid $3,000 for this process, and that was in a year when our medical expenses equaled a third of our total shared income. June was a half million dollar baby. <laughs> Completing our adoption also required us to bring our medically fragile, premature infant to court. June's court date was 10 days after she left the NICU, and this was the only time she left the house aside from doctor's visits for the first three months of her life because the medical team had told us she could not be in public places due to a risk of infection. The current process for obtaining a second parent adoption in Rhode Island creates unnecessary barriers and may prevent families with particular vulnerabilities, families like ours who had a medically fragile child, low-income families, certainly, families who have had negative experiences with court and don't want to show up at family court and don't want to deal with lawyers, from completing the process and protecting their children. Families like ours exist. I hope you'll vote to support House Bills 5706 and 5707 to secure our rights as parents and protect our children. Thank you, Michael. Are you still going, sir? Uh, well, I'll just read you the first page of the personal history questions that all adopters, oh. including second parent adopters, are expected to okay. do. Okay. There, it goes on for 18 pages, but yeah. Uh, where were you born? Please tell us your father's full name, his age when you were born, his national heritage, and his general occupation when you were a child. What was your father like? What were his personal values? How did you get along with him when you were growing up? How do you get along with your father now? What is his occupation? Where does he live? And it goes on. Yeah, I, we get the gist of that. <laughs>